have here our next uh, presentation um, from a guy called Clemens Sch Schul, and I have him actually in my pocket here. Um, it's this little man, um, and he's going to tell us, announce us actually what, it, what he's going to do or what he did. I just leave the stage for him. Yes? Keep it. Pay attention. Here he is, Clemens. Seid ihr auch schon alle da? Hallo, ich bin das Kasperle. Ich möchte euch heute eine Geschichte erzählen. Sie wirkt vielleicht ein bisschen wie ein Märchen, denn viele wünschen sich ja, dass die Digitalisierung ein Märchen mit schönen, eindeutigen Verhältnissen wäre. Aber am Ende seht ihr, dass die Sache nicht so einfach ist. Von einem, der auszog, eine Wohnung in Berlin zu finden. Die ersten beiden Akte waren eigentlich nur metaphorisch zu verstehen. Das waren Ausstellungen. Jetzt aber der dritte Akt auf einer Bühne, vollautomatisch. Wer im Deutschunterricht aufgepasst hat, weiß, im dritten Akt kommt die Katastrophe. Ich erzähle euch noch mal geschwind, was in den ersten beiden Akten passiert ist. Es war einmal eine Prinzessin. Die hatte gerade in Leipzig ihr Kunststudium abgeschlossen. So, um, what you just saw was an exclusive preview for an upcoming exhibition. Um, it's a play about the Wohnungsbot, which I'll tell about more later. And in the upcoming scene that I just stopped now, um, you would have seen the princess realizing that she has to move to Berlin. So, um, let's talk about moving to Berlin. Let's talk about searching for a flat in Berlin. And um, the situation might be similar in a lot of other big cities, but it's hit Berlin especially hard and especially fast recently. Um, so what we can see here is uh, flat viewing. And um, this was, of course, a bit out of the norm, because what happened was that someone was offering a decent flat for a reasonable price, and hundreds of people showed up. Um, and now we're going to ask why, right? And there are deep-going, complex analysis of the situation in Berlin, but I'd rather start with something really, really shallow. How Berlin portrays itself. Um, Berlin, city of freedom. Um, so they've got all these nice slogans there that always end with Weil es geht in Berlin, in Berlin because it's possible in Berlin. Um, and I ask, well, what is possible and what is this freedom? Because really, if I look at the situation of myself and my partner, there's really nowhere it's possible for me in Berlin, apparently. And I don't also understand what should be this freedom of me standing in the cold waiting to view a flat. Uh, what is this freedom exactly they're talking about? Um, the resource housing in Berlin has hit exhaustion. Um, and why I'm putting this connection to the resource exhaustion here is because I think that housing is fundamentally um, a resource allocation problem. And so a lot of what I'm going to say here about housing could be generalized to other resources. So, um, of someone who went forth to find a flat in Berlin, like the fairy tale, um, is a project I've started uh, as a media artist about two years ago when I wanted to move back from here in Leipzig to Berlin. And um, I needed a flat, right? I needed this resource. And so I started looking for a flat, and it looks pretty much like this. You sit in front of your computer all day, and you're refreshing these same websites endlessly. It's really mind-numbing. You sit there, and you sit there. This is day one. Um, it's day two. I hope I'm boring you by this point, because it's really boring and, boring and really annoying to search for a flat in Berlin. You're just wasting your time there. But then by day three, I was so annoyed that I thought, well, actually, I do have a background in computer science, and this is not exactly the thing I like to do. So um, why don't I simply build a bot and automate this entire process? Um, and there I am building this bot, which from the outside, I admit, must look exactly as boring and tedious as searching for a flat yourself. Um, and to do this, I deployed some cutting-edge technology. I'm going to spill some secrets here, so prepare. 
Um, which is basically, well, I'm going to do exactly the same thing as before, just automate it. I was using a browser before, so now I'm just going to automate my browser to do the same things as before. And um, so a lot of people ask me, well, are you hacking this? Are you accessing their API? No, nothing. I'm just using Firefox as before. That's the nice little fellow here. Uh, and then Selenium, which is a way to talk to Firefox to make it do things that you would usually do. And then Python, which is a programming language I like for its simplicity. And what you're doing when you search for a flat is that there's this button. So you're looking for something on this web page. And you say, well, it should say submit or Anfrage senden, which is German for submit this request. And then you're clicking on it cutting edge technology. Um, and so, yeah, if people ask me, is this a hack? No, it's just automation at work for an individual, which seems to be something that we're so unused to that it seems like a hack. But it really, it's, it's a hack as in you're using this really dumb old school technology to do something because you've kind of understood how it works, but you're not doing anything unusual, really. And one thing I want to point out is that building this bot is something I personally enjoy. So I rather spend my time building a bot than looking manually, although I must admit I probably spent as much time tinkering on the bot than if I had looked for the flat manually, honestly. Um, but I'm also pointing this out here because a lot of us here enjoy coding, and so we always think, oh, I could automate this rather than doing it manually, but sometimes that thing that we're automating also for other people might be something they enjoy. So we should take a listen to a kind of we're automating parts of society that maybe there are people that enjoy doing this, but I'm sure there's no one who ever enjoyed looking for a flat online, so I, I feel good there. Um, yeah, and then um, I found a flat through this process. I wouldn't have found this flat otherwise because it was online only for half an hour, and then I moved back to Berlin, and the end of the story. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> Which is, of course, not what happened because people started asking me, oh, I'm in this dire situation. A friend of mine is in this situation. And I get messages and messages, and I started wondering, is it fair if I give these people that happen to know me, who are often computer scientists themselves, um, to give to them these tools? Um, because it's unjust in a sense, right? Um, so let's review what happens if you build a bot. I mean, it works. We see this. I have a flat in Berlin now. It works. It fixed my situation. But it's probably unethical because you're getting this advantage, right? So what happens if you share it with your friends? It also works for them for a while, I guess. Uh, it also kind of fixes their situation, and it's still problematic. And then you're like, oh, I'll release this on GitHub, and everybody can use it. But that's still your friends. It's still people who can use this technology. The first version of the bot I couldn't give to anybody who was not technical because you had to configure it in the command line, all these things. That's not public. That's still your friends just internationally. So what if you give this to the real public? Uh, will it still work? Will it fix anything? And most of all, w in what ethical situation are we there if we're doing this? Also, how do you even do that? How do you give a bot to the public? Because you're still in this resource allocation problem. You're still fighting for the same resource. You're still competing. So there's often the incentive to not even give it to everybody. And not everybody can be satisfied. It's not something I can fix magically to give a flat to everybody in Berlin. So um, that was an interesting situation. And if you're a researcher, you would probably now say, oh, I'll write a paper about this. As a media artist, you will say, oh, let's do an exhibition about this. Uh, and so this is exhibition number one, act for the first act. Your future's calling, reply now, um, which was showed in the Art Academy here in Leipzig. Um, and one thing to know for the people who are not from, from Germany, there's this bit of a competition between Leipzig and Berlin, just who's cooler and where do you move as an artist if you really want to be on the edge. Um, and it was hanging in the atrium of the university, so it was confronting everybody the moment they entered the school. And what you see up there hanging is a banner, um, which is using the same slogans as we saw before. And it reads in, in English, search for a flat on the cultural metropole, Secure your career as an artist because it is possible in Berlin. Uh, and by this stochastic approach, I thought this is the language that you actually reach artists with, hopefully. Um, and what was hanging above it was this box with a printer inside that would print flat ads coming online in Berlin in real time and um, bit by bit flood the atrium with these. Oh. Give me a second. OK, sorry, tech problems. Um, it was filling the atrium with these. Uh, 
Here we are um, with these ads. And what would also happen is that every time something came online, Yes, um, you, we would get this notification sound. Um, and what I was referring to there is that for a lot of people, by now, technology has some, become something very negative. So they have this thing in their pocket that is pushing them to do this thing. They're feeling surveilled all the time. So we've got this very negative narration of technology in our lives. Um, and this was also kind of like reminding them, oh, you haven't made it yet. You haven't moved to Berlin. Pull out your phone now. Do this now. I would see people sitting with me in a bar suddenly pull out the phone being like, oh, there's a new flat online. I have to reply to this now, right? Um, and so they're constantly being feeling like they're being punished by technology. And um, people are going back to brick phones. They dream of moving to the countryside. And I wonder, where have these, these dreams gone um, about automation? Where, where people could maybe feel, feel positive about this. Yeah, now it worked for once. Yes, um, so, so where's, where are these dreams um, about automation? Is anybody still feeling hopeful? And so one person that's feeling hopeful is the bot. Um, the bot made this promise to us. Um, the bot said, well, I can fix this for you, or we can come back to new utopias. And so if we want to give this to the public, if we want a public utopia, we need a lot of computers. Um, and then we can show this to the public. So I selected this um, shop front in Neukölln, which is an area in Berlin which has been hit especially hard by gentrification. And um, the idea was that people could come there and sign up during the exhibition for the Wohnungsbot. They would configure it for themselves. Um, and then I would be standing there in this shop front day and night and search for a flat for them. And um, people in Berlin really know the interface of these platforms, so it had this strong impact on them. They would walk past it and be like, whoa, this would be cool if I didn't have to do it, but ah, unfortunately it doesn't work. Because people, when they realized this is art, immediately thought it wouldn't work. There's a strong association people have between art thingies and things that don't work. They thought it was a video or they thought it was that. No one believed it actually worked. But they had this imagination. I could trigger the imagination of, whoa, what if the w we had a world where these things were possible? And then at the end of the exhibition, I made this possible. Um, I put it on the Wohnungsbot website. You can still download it right now. It works, wohnungsbot.de, uh, where it was downloadable for all the major platforms. And now coming back to this, what is public if you're building a bot? Public to me means it's easily installable. You don't need to know about technology. You don't need to understand anything. Uh, and so I look for something where I could have the same automation tools as before, so a thinly wrapped browser. And I know a lot of you hate Electron. But really, for something like this, we need to get something to the public in an easy and understandable way. It's a great tool, because public means accessible. Otherwise, you're just building software for you and your friends. Um, and so I spent a lot of time tinkering on the user interface. Um, it first greets you. Then it tells you a bit about, well, this is actually art. It's not just something that you can use. You can use it, but there's an art aspect to it. And then comes the important part of the configuration. You first tell it, um, this is where I want to live. This is the type of flat that I need. And here I already started inserting some useful things that you usually can't do, such as saying, well, I'm not willing to pay more than 10 euros per square meter. So I'm willing to put this much money up, but only if I get more space, because otherwise you just end up with expensive apartments with little space left. Um, then you have to put in tons of personal data, which was not my idea. This is just what the platforms request from you. And now the cool part, um, your personal application. And as you can see here, it uses placeholders. Um, so the bot can later on imitate you much better. It will pull on, put in the landlord's name or the landlady. So the, the lesser's data will be in there. The street data will be in there. Normal people also just copy, paste, and do this by hand. Uh, and now the bot will pretend to be this human for you. Then you review everything if the data is correct. And then you start it, and you see on the right-hand side the normal user interface, so you can really see it acting. You can see it clicking. You can see it typing. There's an overlay for you to understand it better, but it's really just the, the, the normal website running in the background. And on the left side, you have an overview of what you've done so far. And then comes the fun part where you watch your computer uh, writing this application for you. 
So now you will ask, okay, this is a nice bot. You've showed us you can, you can build a bot, but where's the art in this, right? What's, what's the artistic aspect of this? Um, and so I haven't, uh, there's one more thing I haven't shown of the exhibition yet. There was this kind of like art stopper, kind of like a shop stopper just for art. Um, and it, it claimed that the artwork, which you cannot see here, is the change of the network. So what is this change in the network that I'm referring to here? Um, there's three ways of looking for a flat at the moment. You can do it manually, you can search with the notifications the platform provides, or you do it fully automated. And when you're doing it manually, you'll sit there refreshing the same website all day. Because if you're not fast, you're not getting it. You can wait for their notifications, but the problem there is that the notification might come so late that the flat has gone on offline again. Like flats in Berlin are sometimes online only for 30 minutes or something. Or the bot sits there and refreshes the website all day, which sounds better, right? Um, then you normally spend valuable time reviewing the flat. And this is something I'll come back to later a lot with this time you spend reviewing flats. And what you have to keep in mind here is that you'll all often assess a flat that you won't get afterwards. So you're just wasting time on things that you, you, you have no chance of getting. Um, the bot doesn't do this. You just applies to everything. And um, then comes the part where you have to write the application, which doesn't consume that much time. I mean, copy, pasting, and putting in the lesser's name doesn't take much time. But you have to be in front of your computer, which is hard, especially if you're a working person. Most of the flats come online during the day. Um, and you have to be there to do this physically, or on, at least on your, on your device. Um, the bot can do this by, by, by itself, um, because like, this is one thing you'll all know. Bots are really good at copy-pasting, and this is what's necessary here, um, natural bot work. And then it's the lesser's turn. The lesser um, will go through the first few messages that hit their inbox, so it's important to be fast, and then it says, well, is this person, does it fit my criteria, and invite you or maybe not invite you? And I've explicitly left out the option that the bot gets rejected here, because of course it can get rejected, but you will never know. You have never reviewed the apartment, you've not written an, um, an application, you've not wasted time on it, so it doesn't matter if it gets rejected once in a while. Whereas if you really wanted this lad, you'll feel sad if you don't get it. Um, and now this little black bot jumped up there, right? So what does this mean? Um, it means that there's another case of people feeling mistreated by technology when the lesser start using email responders automatically to simply message the first 20, 30 people the viewing is next week at this time and date. And there, there was this article in the New York Times recently where it said um, that human contact is becoming a luxury good. And so not even when you're ex applying for a flat, you're being treated by a human anymore. Um, so sometimes you'll feel sad that you didn't get the viewing. Sometimes you'll feel happy. But in the case of the bot, this is the first time you assess the flat. So only if you're invited, you start considering, will I really go there or not? Um, and so I want to talk about, about like, working time here. And why working time matters, and this will maybe get a bit chaotic, but I'll still try, is that if we jump on this theory of like the labor theory of value, which you might not subscribe to, but just as a thought experiment, um, it says that a product is just measured by the socially necessary time to produce it, that's its value. If you look at time, historically, you would have a real estate agent. They would spend time on finding this resource for you, and you would give them money. Normal transaction. Now these platforms appeared, online platforms, which promise to you, you can do this in your like, previously free time. Um, you can do this, of course, for free. Um, you are saving money there. But you're not realizing that, in a sense, you're working because they're somehow still making a profit. So who's making this profit how if no one is spending time on it? Um, and so, so this gave, came, came to me to this idea of, okay, if, if we're not OK with the current situation of housing, Maybe this is a way we can reject it by saying, OK, we're not putting up free time anymore to work on this. We'll push this to the lessers. Because if you're not spending this time, someone has to spend it, and this will be the lessers again. So there could be this hypothesis of like a working time denial of service attack, um, which sounds cool, but of course doesn't work. Because the lessers, what they will do is still just go to the 10, 20 first messages and select the best offer that you gave them. Because we're always getting, giving them our best effort, and they can just choose. So as a thought experiment, it's nice. It's something I would keep, like, keep you in the back of your head. But it's not how it works. The lessers will still always win. And so if we say, well, this is what we dreamed of, right? You write this simple Python script, uh, and then you, you fix the social problem. This is what we wanted. But what really happens is this. 
you write this simple Python script, you think you can, oh, we can just do some text solutionism, and the problems just multiplicate because the problems will adapt. There will be problems within your solution, all these things. Um, and so the, the slogan of the bot I've come up with was, there is no technological solution for social problems. And of course, some of you will jump up here and say, no, 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 there are things. And so I will go back to, okay, there are no exclusively technological solutions to social problems, because of course, under certain circumstances, um, technolo technology can play an important role. But where I want to get at is that if we simply reframe this as, it's not a solution, it's a reaction. If we just change this word, we get a lot further. So let's reframe this. I've not solved the Berlin housing market situation. I've reacted to it. So do this the next time you're discussing a solution with someone. See if reaction would not be the, the, the proper word for what you want. And if we say reaction, another thing becomes apparent that someone else might react too. If I had solved it, no one would talk about it anymore. It would be solved. But I've only reacted, so the platforms will also react. And reacting for them mostly means forbidding. How do you forbid a bot? Well, there's mainly three ways. You can put in technical barriers, um, which are mostly designed to say, well, you, you should be human to do this. Prove your humanity, um, which might get interesting in the future with more AI and um, yeah, better capture prevention technology. Um, there's legal barriers, which is simple. You just tell people, do not automate this, otherwise I will sue you, and you will be bankrupt forever. Um, seems like a simple solution. And there's another thing that we don't think about that much, but which is important, which is simply moving on. So people admire capitalism for its ability to adapt. Uh, and so this is, these are three startups that, from what I understand, have adapted to the situation. These are platforms where you sign up, you put in your profile, and you can't search for flats. They have a matching algorithm, which will then say, oh, this lesser is looking for someone with a high income, so hey, do you lesser, pick one of these 10 people that we suggest to you. And I hope that you all see the danger here is that what is happening now implicitly would be explicit, that people can filter by only high income people, only people, well, it might be latent variables at some point in the future, only people that are of like the social class, all these things. Um, so it just moves on. Um, and then the question is, can we even use automation for good? Is it maybe implicitly designed to not help us but the other side? And to understand this, um, I'll go to, to uh, Michel Soto, who, who has these two words which we use in our normal uh, life interchangeably. But So he does not use them interchangeably. He says, strategy is something institutions do when they're trying to plan for, for activities. And there's tactics which we use individual, as individuals. And one example for this is that if we look at a city, Institutions, such as the city government, um, come up with strategies. They say, here are the entrances to this park, there are the exits, this is where you should move. And all of us, we have tactics. We're like, oh, I'll do a shortcut here, I'll do this, I'll do that. So we, uh, the, the strategy never really works out because we adapt it for our needs. But our tactics never change the rules of the game. And that's the important part here. We don't change the rules of the game, we just adapt. And a bot is obviously a tactic if I do it for myself. I found a way to, to like, find my ways through the housing market. And the question is, if I release this to the public, can this become a strategy? Can we scale software in a sense that we're now on an equal eye level um, to, to this really becoming um, a strategic thing? And the answer is, of course, not in case of the warnings, but, but theoretically, maybe. And how would this maybe look like? We were still allocating resources, and so what we would need if we really wanted to have a strategy here is to have a proper resource allocation mechanism that works, that isn't just based on money, that is not perpetuating the inequalities we already have. And this is the hard part. We live in a society where the only resource allocation mechanism we know is money, which leads exactly to capitalism. Um, so the challenge is to find new resource allocation mechanisms, which I honestly don't know about, but there's people out there who look into this, which we should listen to. I'm just an artist. Um, and so as a summary of this, and also like a very obvious take home lesson, if you build bots for yourself, Ask yourself, am I gaining an advantage here, and is it unfair? Am I giving others the possibility to take advantage of this, which will usually be your friends, either physical friends or GitHub friends? Um, and then would it be theoretically possible to give everybody this benefit? And if you say, oh, yes, I have something that does match these criteria, then that appears the question, should we have a right to do this? Should there be a right to automate? Um, which is hard, this question, um, because what would be the implications of this? If we look at Congress, um, 
they, they're struggling with finding a way that is both privacy preserving and uh, does not resort to brain, brain licenses in giving out these tickets. So it's hard to allow automation without being deeply intrusive on privacy or some other level um, and allowing for this. So a bot for yourself works, whereas a bot for the public often leads to expectable systemic failure. So I, did, I, I released the Wohnungsbot with, with two intentions. On one hand, giving people this, this thought of, oh, automation could be cool. It could be something positive. This could be something I'm looking forward to. But then also the failure. So this is like, it's, it's a drama, right? And we're now <laughs> coming to this dramatic end where we simulate failure. We know that the Wohnungsbot currently works. You can download it but it will fail in the future. Um, and so I wanted to simulate this before it happens so we can learn from it and, and adapt as a society. And um, the way I wanted to simulate this is uh, coming back to theater. Theater is a really old technique for simulating something and sharing your insights with an audience. So as the last consequence, uh, which is uh, the title of Act 3, we, well, I build a theater. Um, and as I'm into automation, I built a fully automated puppet theater. Uh, again, puppet theater being something that's publicly accessible, in my opinion. It's something that people can relate to and thereby hopefully better understand what I'm trying to tell as a story. Um, and again, I'm using very high-end technology. Um, so the, the plot of the theater, we, we from the very beginning, is that the princess wants to move back to Berlin, and the Wohnungsbot tells her, well, I've helped so many people, I will help you find a flat. Uh, and the, the princess, uh, historically, in these German puppet theaters, is someone very helpless. Um, so she's in the position of someone needy here, but if you watch the full play, you will see that she's really cool. Don't worry. Um, the Wohnungsbot says, I can do this for you. He's helped so many people. But now as everybody's using it, the landlords are, and the lessers are reacting, and they have the lesser bot now, the Famita bot. And the Famita bot keeps rejecting the princess because other people with more income have also started using the bot, and her income is not high enough to have any chance anymore. And we'll now jump back into the play at the dramatic end with the, um, the war of the bots. <laughs> Ich bin gescheitert. Verzeih mir, Prinzessin, aber ich finde keine Wohnung für dich. Der Traum von einer einfachen Wohnungssuche ist vorbei. Habe ich nur funktioniert, weil ich einigen Menschen geholfen habe, unter den Ersten zu sein? Ich ändere die Logik und Diskriminierungen der Wohnungssuche doch nicht. Wenn ein Mensch dich ein Jahr lang vergeblich auf seine Wohnungssuche ansetzt, ist das tragisch, weil er dann immer noch keine Wohnung hat, aber immerhin hat er nicht seine eigene Zeit mit der Suche verbracht. Verbracht, verschwendet, gelitten, Finger und Geist abgestumpft. Du bist alles, was wir haben, um zu zeigen, dass wir nicht mehr mitmachen. Wir verweigern uns, indem wir unsere Arbeitszeit verweigern. Nur so können wir Automatisierung in unserer Gesellschaft neu verhandeln. Du bist der Holzschuh, den wir in das Getriebe der Maschinen werfen können. Nein, bin ich nicht. Schluss jetzt mit dem Gekasper. Ich bin das falsche Werkzeug. Ich bin eine Maschine, mir ist Berlin so egal wie der Investoren, die dein Haus gekauft haben. 12049-10997-10249-13353 Ich kenne eure Postleitzahlen, aber ich war in keiner eurer Straßen. Die Investoren ja wahrscheinlich auch nicht. Hat mein Gesicht euch Hoffnung gegeben? Habe ich für einen von euch eine Wohnung gefunden? Hätte ich Emotionen, würde mich das für euch freuen, ehrlich. Aber ich muss euch enttäuschen. Ich helfe Menschen, eine Wohnung zu finden. Das funktioniert eine Zeit lang ganz gut. Sie finden schneller und einfacher eine Wohnung, weil mich nicht alle Menschen verwenden. Irgendwann verwenden mich alle, dann hat niemand mehr einen Vorteil. Aber zumindest verwendet auch niemand mehr Zeit mit der Wohnungssuche, soweit der Traum. Aber mal ganz ehrlich, darum geht es hier doch nicht. Denkt mal nicht nur an euch. Was ist denn mit denen, die gar kein Internet zu Hause haben? Oder keinen Rechner? Anders gesagt, vereinfacht, was ist mit all den Menschen, die egal wie lange sie suchen, egal mit welchen Mitteln, K 
keine adäquate Wohnung finden werden, die sie sich leisten können? Die, die hier wirklich verdrängt werden, kommen in der öffentlichen Debatte doch eigentlich gar nicht vor. Die, die seit Monaten eine Wohnung suchen und du wenn du sie siehst und sprechen hörst auch sofort weißt, da helfen keine weiteren Monate mehr, da hilft kein Bot. Unser System hat euch aufgegeben. Ich bin das falsche Werkzeug. Ich glaube ein wirklich gutes Werkzeug zu sein, ich funktioniere wie gedacht, ich automatisiere gut, arbeite selbstständig und unablässlich, aber ich bin der Falsche. Es wurde schon oft gesagt, aber ich kann es nur wiederholen, es gibt keine technischen Lösungen für soziale Probleme. Vielleicht habe ich für den ein oder anderen erfolgreich eine Wohnung gesucht, das hat aber nichts gebracht. Ich kann euch nicht helfen. Ihr müsst die Werkzeuge weglegen und es wieder in die Hand nehmen, gemeinsam. Organisiert euch. Greift zurück auf die bewährten Mittel, Regulierungen, Steuern, Umverteilung, zur Notenteignung. Techniken, Jahrtausende alt, bewährt, was wollt ihr mehr? Eure Wut hat das falsche Ziel, das Problem ist nicht die Wohnungssuche, sondern der Wohnungsmarkt. Das Problem ist, dass Wohnen überhaupt ein Markt ist. Ich bin der Wohnungsbot, ein Kunstprojekt, ein Hack, der aus dem persönlichen Bedarf in die Öffentlichkeit getragen wurde. Ein junger Bot mit großem Versprechen, großen Ambitionen. Aber mein Scheitern war immer das Ziel. Ich scheitere, um hier vor euch zu stehen und zu sagen, ihr seid noch nicht gescheitert, noch könnt ihr das angehen. Ich scheitere, um euch zu warnen, ihr dürft nicht scheitern, auf euch ist die Stadt gebaut. Jetzt ist der Moment, in dem ihr noch einfordern könnt, wie ihr wollt, dass Wohnungen vergeben werden. Jetzt ist noch der Moment, in dem ihr mitbestimmen könnt, wie Automatisierung unser Leben gestalten soll. Jetzt ist euer Moment gekommen, nicht meiner. Yo. Thank you, Clement. Super. <laughs> Got a, I had you in my pocket, so uh, I, can, <laughs> I can imagine some people have a question here. And uh, please step up and take your microphone and uh, yeah, drop it. Number four, there is someone. I'm sorry if it's on your website, but did you plan on porting the Wohnungsbot to other cities? <laughs> uh, it's a question that's been asked from day one. Um, why Berlin? Why not another city? This and that situation. A city is in a much worse situation. Um, the, re the reason I chose Berlin is not only because I was there myself, um, it's because I think that it's the, the, city, the city in Berlin that is the most interesting, the, in, in Germany, that is the most interesting in this aspect. It feels to me like the one city where this situation could actually change. Um, so they're right now debating something called the Mietendeckel, uh, kind of like the cap on rents, which will really get into the situation where we have to reconsider how do we allocate uh, flats afterwards. So I think it's the city where the most is moving. And I wanted to have it only in one city because to me, artworks are kind of like experiments that exist outside of the scientific way. So I'm still wanting to experiment with something. I want to have a model. If I do this with every th city in Germany, we don't learn anything because it will just change everywhere. I wanted to have one city where we can see how does it change if we apply the solu solution, right? <laughs> I'm using it myself. How, how, does it be, how does the city react if we do this com in comparison to all the other cities? Um, and so, I mean, the, the source code is in GitHub. I know that all of you can fix it for your own cities. Um, I'm not doing it for the public because that's not my goal. It's still an artistic research in that sense where I want to see what happens in Berlin. Yes, uh, number three is here. Another Thank question. You. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have not really questions, only two recommendations. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, you said something uh, in the end about, uh, well, people being rich and how to pass by them. Sometimes I th myself I think of that we are the new riches, we the technical people who get around the, the expensive things by the automating things. Because it's great to automate things and pass by everything who buy, uh, by uh, the people who have to pay for everything. I m don't mean stealing, but automating things. Well, that, that gives you some kind of richness that we deserve. Second thing is, I saw your theater thing and first thing I thought was, oh, this would be cool if you would do it with an improvisation group. I play improvisation theater myself and if you get an improvisation group on stage and you give them the input, I am a robot, you play the robot, 
and they play with you, you can get amazing scenes on and, and share ideas about this whole housing problem, I, I, not I only have in to Berlin. Cut the commercials yeah. here. Huh? Hey, hey, sorry. <laughs> but improvisation. Okay, the advertisement time is over. Number two again. Yeah, okay. Well, let me give me do you want one short reaction. You want to shoot? Um, you said, well, there, there's other forms of being rich, such as knowing how to code, and I think in that sense we should uh, see capital as something very wide. Capital is not only money, it's also there's social capital, there's cultural capital, and in the long term these all Would converge you? into one another. So it really doesn't matter if you only know how to code now, at some point you will accumulate classical capital, so we can focus on that, I think. Two things I want to ask. Uh, the first thing is, did you check GitHub before creating everything from scratch? Because there are already proje uh, projects there that work uh, quite fine. And I want to understand. Um, well, at the point that I checked, there was someone who had built something that would automate parts of it. But as I was trying to point out, something being on GitHub to me is not the same as being public. Um, and so I wanted to build something. I mean, I've built the bot twice with the exact purpose of building something that's not on GitHub, but somewhere where people can actually use it. Um, so I was reviewing things that existed, but my goal was different. It was not just to find something for me, but to release something to the public. Okay, and the other thing I want to ask is, why did you choose such a high level of automation? Uh, advertisements on Scout, for example, are deactivated after 25 non-premium requests. And if you give such a bot with a high automation to many people, uh, this will lead uh, to many flats going off the market very fast from people who did not even check them manually. You're pointing out one thing where you can say, okay, this is problematic, the bot shouldn't exist, you're creating a problem. And I was trying to point this out before, that whenever you, you react to a, a problem that's social and not technical, you will create new problems. And so what you're pointing out is one of these many new problems that will arise from this. Um, the same being like, what is with people that don't have a desktop computer at home, right? I met people at the exhibition that were like, I can't download this at home because I don't have a desktop computer, I don't have internet at home. And this is where, where you must see this is not meant to, to solve this, to do this or to that. This is an art project. I want to get into this discussion with you. I want to have people on the street thinking, okay, maybe we need different technology. Maybe we need different regulation, a different society. So this is about this, uh, creating this imagination, about creating aesthetical moments for yourself uh, and not fixing this. Uh, so yes, there are all these problems, but that was not my, my focus in this. Um, I wanted to, to have a theater there where people can start dreaming rather. Okay, thanks. Correct. Number three, please. Hi. Um, you basically said if I use your bot and the response rate depends on my income. Um, what is your experience if I say, okay, but I pay more for the flat? So as it's capitalism, if I pay more for something and I say I pay more for my flat, I will get more responses? Um, I've heard from people doing this uh, in other countries. I've never heard of someone actually doing it in Germany to just offer to pay more. I have no idea how people react here, if there's something where they can't do it. Like, it it's not something people talk about in my surroundings, so I have no idea really. Um, it might work, it might not work, I don't know. No, I mean more um, if, I, if you search for a flat which costs 700, it's really hard to find because so many people are looking for flats. But I say, okay, but for me it's fine also 900 and I adapt the search parameters, do I get a higher response rate with your bond? If, if you, <laughs> I mean the thing will, if, if you're looking for flats for 700 in Berlin, you'll likely get very few responses because there's very few flats like that out there. <laughs> I can tell you that much. Um, I, I've not done any data, re I was considering adding data research parts to this, um, I've not done, so I cannot give you any statistics on where you'll get the best response rates. Um, it's out there, you can tinker with this, um, but that was not my focus here. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Are there other questions here uh, online? No one online. Um, there we can close, I think. Uh, Bourdieu is a good uh, reference, actually, that he gave regarding capital, social capital, economic, uh, you know. <laughs> Look that up, because that's actually the next step uh, about what is then the context and in what kind of context one you, you want to live, actually, and with what kind of people do you have to integrate. Thank you for this fantastic thing, uh, for the theater that you gave us. Thank you for the doll. Thank you.